Hi everyone. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, CLS, for for having me on today. And I'm sorry about the audio difficulties, but we can make this work. Uh, my name is Jerome. I work at Lee Day. I'm part of the immigration and asylum team there. Um, it's a relatively new team. You know, Lee Day is a you know out long-standing um, human rights and and group claims firm. They actually only started the immigration and asylum team a couple of years ago. So previously they did some public law immigration work, but we we started the the new immigration asylum team that's headed up by by Jack who's on the call. It's nice to see a lot of our familiar faces. I think Chris, BB, Dr. Liz and the and Glenda, um, Susan Andrews. So you know thank everyone for coming. Yes, yeah, so so I've been asked to speak about Windrush, the ongoing scandal. Um, a lot of the work that I do are Windrush cases. So really just in this about 10 minutes just to go through. Can you go to the next slide, please, Steve? For discussion, the themes and narratives, um, I've broken this up into three parts. So let's talk about the past, the present, and the future. So the past, how did we get here? Looking at institutional forgetting and the legislation that brought us here. And then to look at um, and provide some insights from, from our practice and the, the clients that we see up and close with the Windrush Compensation Scheme, you know, some of the pitfalls and some of the, the successes, you know, where credit is due for, for the compensation schemes, what that looks like, the present. And then forward looking, um, I've put this as future designs of compensation. What has the community response looked like? What does it look like to build resilient community infrastructures? Um, and that'll be, you know, looking at the community response and a lot of the amazing groups which are doing all the grassroots work. So thank you, Steve. Next slide, please. Great. Institutional forgetting and legislation. Uh, I put this quote here, uh, a negligent mother country. It's actually a quote from Gary Young when he was talking about Windrush, and I thought it was very accurate. And you know, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I think everybody in the call um, knows how we got here. But I just thought just some of these these events were quite interesting to, to, to pinpoint. 1945, a poll was conducted um, and 61% of British respondents in this poll couldn't name a UK colony. And that shows you the, the, that kind of institutional forgetting that took place. In 1950, this is a colonial, so this is before the acts that restricted citizenship. James Griffiths, the colonial secretary, was asked to submit a cabinet memorandum on problems arising from the immigration of coloured people from the West Indies and other territories. The cabinet then set up a committee looking at how to check coloured immigration. 1951, Churchill endorses the Keeping Them White campaign slogan. 1958, um, we see the Nottingham and Notting Hill riots. And then really that lays the ground, you know, that th those relations just going through lays the ground for what we see from 1962 to 1971. Um, we see the 1962 Commonwealth Immigration Act, the 68 Im Commonwealth Immigration Act, and the 71 Nationality Act. And really, this just restricts, and I put here legislation exclusion, and we see these acts really just fulfill what was asked, of 19, asked in 1950, how to check coloured immigration um, and how to restrict people coming from the Caribbean who previously you know, could have come from, from Jamaica or Guyana or Barbados to the UK, to the mother country, um, you know, in the same way that you would move about the UK now. But those acts slowly restrict it. Next slide, please, Steve. And then one more. Okay, can you go back one? Sorry, now I've, I'm not quite sure how to do that. <laughs> okay, oh, that, that's go. fine. That's it. Yeah, these, and then here I just wanted to point about on this part of how we got here. These are just two, these are two images taken by a photographer called Ahmet Francis, um, a part of his a Jamaican photographer, and this was his part of an exhibition he did previously called the Black Triangle. And really, I just wanted to pinpoint these because that history that we're just looking at from from the fifties and to the seventies of restricting, um 
immigration, you know, Commonwealth immigration to the UK. And really these photos, there you see Angela Davis um, in 1975, and the photo on the left, and she's at the Kirkyside Art Centre in London. And then that's, that's taken in 1975. And then next to it is 71, Brixton Mark. I just wanted to bring these photos to kind of bring into relief that despite these, these acts and this legislative exclusion, um, you know, the Black Power movements, Bricks and Collectives, there was Black organisations really resisting it in the 70s and 80s and, and, and laying the groundwork of that resistance that we that we see today. So fast forward, next slide, please, Steve. Fast forward 2018, the scandal. Um, we all know what happened in 2018. I put a clipping there from, from the Mirror. Th Theresa May branded disgrace over threat to Windrush immigrants who've been in Britain 50 years. But really, this, the story starts a bit earlier. Um, and this is something that, that Jackie, Jackie McKenzie mentioned that as early as 20, 2015, for example, CARICOM um, heads of governments and diplomats were meeting and, and bringing this up that there were people who were losing status. Um, and that there was no there was no kind of scheme or kind of redress. So this was already in the pipeline for years previously. Then the scandal broke in 2018. The groundwork for this was laid by Labour 2007, really with the hostile environment, um, laying the ground for the hostile environment that the coalition 2010 government uh, put, put in a proposal for. And then finally, 2012, it comes into law. Um, they bring into law 2014 and 16 acts. So the scandal erupts in 2018. Chris, I just want to make a point here on numbers. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please, Steve? Okay. And then the scandal responses. So um, the scandal erupts in 2018 at those initial newspaper articles. And here I'd like to go to the government responses before we go to the community responses. So we get an omission and an apology. We have the government schemes which are, which emerge, the Windrush scheme, the compensation scheme, and a hardship fund. Uh, briefly, the Windrush scheme is for is all about documents. It's not about compensation. So if you're eligible, if you came before 73 or 88, you could, um, you could apply via this scheme to get your status regularize and crucially this this comes at no fees um rather than paying over a thousand pounds um to naturalize if, if you weren't part of the group stakeholder groups form the winrush lessons learn review advisory group the stakeholder advisory group and we get the lessons learn review a couple of years later in 2020 and the next slide um yes now you know, taking into account that history of how we got to to Windrush and how we got to the scandal in the first place, at the moment, and there's a lot of complaints about the, the compensation scheme, I just wanted to look at and what we see in practice, um, some of the limited positives that we see. I think we do really need to wrestle with this compensation scheme. There are a lot of issues with it, but some of the limited positives, before I come on to the negatives, um, we've seen an increase in the minimum impact on life payments. So previously, if you had made out a claim under the compensation scheme, you would get, and it was accepted as initially eligible, you would get £250, which is just you know absolutely derisory. Um, and really, and this is a testament to the community and the community response that that this has increased and these these key changes are really from community work and that has now gone up minimum impact on life gone up to ten thousand pounds the scheme we do have access for secondary claimants um, if you yourself have applied but if you are a direct descendant and you have had you've suffered loss impact on life um, immigration fees for example you can also make a claim which is positive um, and we see it in other areas of law, that's not always the case. And also preliminary payments. We're seeing that these preliminary payments, once you've made an initial claim out, um, you can get up to £10,000 preliminary payment. And we're seeing the speed of those are going up. So those would be some of the positives that I would put about the scheme before going to negatives in the next slide, Steve. So 
So, um, I've broken this down into three parts to talk about the compensation scheme. If you're looking for the most recent data, um, you can go to the Windrush fact sheet. It's on the home office and it breaks down. Then you can see from that screenshot um, all of the different numbers, how many people have applied, how much has been paid out so far. The home office likes to come with this figure of 75 million. So 75 million has been paid out so far. Um, in terms of compensation scheme payments, there have been 2,076, and that's accurate from the January data. Um, we don't have February's not come out yet. And then for the Commonwealth community, about 7,000 scheme applications. So 7,000 people have their status regularized. But these numbers to put into context, um, mm -hmm. in 2018, the National Audit Office thought there are about 50,000 people who are affected. So I think those that really speaks to there's a lot more work to do here. Um, 2,000 compensation scheme payments five years in is actually very limited when you break it down by year. So there's, and that's why the Home Office have said that the compensation scheme will remain open. I think that's an important part. The outreach has not been sufficient. And then moving on to decision-making and funding. And this is something that we're seeing in practice. Um, at the moment, if you want to put in a compensation scheme application, the Home Office expects you to do this without any kind of support, any kind of legal representation. You can't get any kind of legal aids, but this is this is really a legal job. You know, you have to demonstrate your loss in housing, employment, um, health, education. You have to go through all of these heads of loss. You're expected to gather evidence. And we really see the difference um, when people are represented, not represented. And there's been incredible work, people not represented, you know, incredibly astute, and have got big payouts. Uh, but really, this is a legal job to maximize the money that you will get. Having a solicitor involved will really support that. And we've seen it from practice where um, people have been refused a couple of times. Re re they've received nil awards. And then once representation has come, I've got six figure awards. And so I think that's a crucial point. Yes, outreach is important, but also in terms of the, the legal representation. There is an absolute need, uh, whether this is done by legal aid, whether the Home Office, really the Home Office should be paying the legal fees so that once people are found, they can put in quality claims that will get them the compensation they deserve. At the moment, there's no budging on that, so that needs to change. And then on evidential burdens, um, very little provision for loss of earnings, also, med also medical reports. If we have to prove, for example, there's been an impact on life, it's very difficult to get a med medical report done and paid for by the Home Office for that review. So those are some of the technicalities. The positives, you know, I spoke about, there are some positives, but these are really important issues here. You know, we've got um, thousands more people to reach on the Home Office estimates. Can you go to the next slide, please, Steve? Great, and this is this is a quote um, from the Guardian. I don't know if, if you can if you can read this. I'll read it out. And this is a link to the post office scandal. The post office scandal, though, is but one of a series. From the Hillsborough Stadium disaster to Grenfell, from the NHS contaminated blood tragedy to child sex abuse in Rotherham, from the English language testing fiasco to the Windrush horrors, each of which is different but all of which reveal certain underlying themes. Some are about corporate greed, others official malfeasance or government neglect, and some about both. What all have in common is the lack of public accountability for the misdeeds that have devastated so many people's lives. And I put that in there, and I think this is a, a topic for discussion to, to think about. The post office scandal called one of the biggest miscarriages of justice in, in British history, about 900 people affected. If you start to look at the different the differential treatment for the Windrush cohort and what we're seeing emerge for the post office cohort, this raises serious questions. Um, Martin Ford KC 
who designed the compensation scheme um, in 2018, 2019, he was recently interviewed by the BBC and he brought this up and explained how, for example, um, in the post office, in the post office scheme, you've got retired parliamentarians, judges, compensation schemes we th that doesn't exist in windrush i think that's a point of contention that you know we need to think about as a community and organizing how we address that um and i think it's about you know working together really to highlight these differences but also to ask how can we make sure that that kind of expertise is brought into windrush loss of potential earnings you're not getting that windrush it's not getting looked at in the same way or pensions these are all issues that the post office um, scandal is receiving support for. Next slide, please, Steve. Great. Okay, so going through the history of how we got here um, and then the technicalities of all the issues, some positives, a lot of negatives about the, the compensation in our schemes. I wanted to talk about, now let's talk about the future. Um, and about re resilient community infrastructures and wider compensation systems. Really, after the scandal broke, we've seen um, an amazing group of civil society organizations emerge. And this is a quote from Action for Race Equality. Grassroots civil society organizations are critical bridge and the community engagement methods are crucial to reaching more of those affected. These have sprung up all across the country. Uh, next slide, please, Steve. And you see here, for example, in Luton, Preston, Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, and London. Um, and these are groups set up in community centres who are offering frontline advice and assistance to people who have been affected. Um, a lot of, so it's really casework support. And I think this is, this is the kind of infrastructure which is really interesting that we need to build on in the next years. If you go to the next slide. Great. And so I'd highlight this report um, that was repaired by Jackie in 2021, I think it was. My reading's born on this screen. Um, so this preluded the funding which went out to a lot of these groups and the ACE Action for Race Equality are now managing. And really what it says on the title is building the capacity of these grassroots community groups to respond to the Windrush scandal. Um, and then next slide. And this shows you some of the work um, that the funding allows groups to do in terms of paying for caseworkers, administrative costs, um, and signposting to other organizations. Next slide. And yeah, at the moment, this is the round three of funding for, for community groups who are looking for that, that kind of support. I think it opened in December, 2023. But I think these, these groups are really crucial and, and really carrying, um, you know, the Windrush cohort in terms of getting access to support, in terms of being signposted for further support if required, but also opens up a space to imagine in these infrastructures, in these community centres, what other support is required beyond immigration and analysing the scheme. I think that's what you're already seeing with a lot of these groups are asking wider questions of, what does a black focused group and infrastructure, what else can we look at? Can we look at health and education? And also in this moment where there's been such a dearth of those kind of community spaces, how does that open up a window um, to imagine what we can do? So then the next slide, please. Great. Yes. Yeah, so to conclude, I feel like I've been, Talking for quite a while now. Um, what to make? Yeah, the, that was just those points there about how we look at wide, how we look at windrush compensation. Because on one hand, we have the individualistic compensation, and that's what people are doing now. What we're doing a lot, Elite, is working within the scheme um, to reach the kind of policy outcomes that we need. Then community infrastructures, building the structures of support from these kind of these community groups which have emerged, but then also the wider compensation discussion. Um, and I was discussing this with 
with um with a friend Chris yesterday. I think yeah, I think Chris on the call. But how when you picture Windrush compensation and how it's very much focused on the individualistic compensation, but actually if you if you focus on the compensation, what does compensation for the cohort look like um, in terms of reparatory justice? So I think that's where that's the the next issue we need to look at is what does wider calls for for reparations for compensation look like for the group rather than individualistic um, compensation? Thank you. Great, right. thank thank you, thank you very much, Yev. Thank you for that presentation. I think it's, you know, you've covered a comprehensive uh, uh, amount of the work that needs to happen really around Windrush, including the political work and community organizing together. You know, there's going to be no change unless we mobilize and organize. Um, very early on, CLS, you know, held a, a mass meeting, which was well attended, and we're about due to do another meeting. So we will make sure that we keep putting the pressure. Clearly, the government's move to try and move the, the, the whole scheme outside of London um, was one act to try and make it more difficult for people to claim. And it's not surprising that the low numbers who've actually received any kind of um, compensation so far and so much more to do. Um, we know that they were thinking about this for a very long time, for sure, because certainly when Cameron went to, to Jamaica, people raised questions about compensation and reparations and so on. One of the things he did was to actually give the Jamaican government a jail. And then it's transpired. They've got all these plans to try and, you know, criminals, people who commit crimes, who got heritage um, outside of, the UK, you know, they try to post them away. Um, so we see their plan well ahead. We know it's no accident the way they're behaving towards us. And we need to make sure that we keep fighting for the rights for our people. But thank you very much for that presentation. We'll take questions um, and comments. Um, if I can see rays of hands, um, that might help. And Steve, maybe if I miss, if I'm missing, depends on which screen I'm looking at. You can just um, alert me to if there's any hands I'm not seeing. Um, yes, we've got Stephen Howard, and I think there were some questions in the. Were there any questions? People can put their questions in the chat there are, as well. There are three and, hands uh, up. up there's those. Stephen Howard. Right. Uh, there's yeah. Doctor Okokon and Dr. there's Okokon. E. Lucas. Yeah. Have all put their hands up. I'll, I'll go last. I'll okay. go last. Stephen, Stephen, Stephen Howard. Went last. Up first. Okay, Steve. I, I, I'll go last I've already spoken. Okay, uh, two questions. Was there a class action lawsuit in Britain on Windrush? And the second thing is, for those people who traveled uh, back to Jamaica or wherever, not realizing that their status had been compromised and could not return to Britain, how that did that impact on their employment, their insurance, their the the benefits that they were supposed to receive, as well as the family members who were dependent on their return? Thank you. Yeah. Right. Did, um, how do you prefer to do this, um, Jerome? Do you do you want me to take the three questions now, or you want to? Yeah, I think that's straight that's away. Here. Yeah, that's better. Free, okay. Yeah. Okay, Dr. O'Connor, please. Come in, Dr. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Jerome. I'm very proud of you. Thank you very much for this hard work that you've been doing. And I'm really appreciating the fact that um that you're you know you're out there doing this. Um you know, Jackie, I think, needs that support. I think she's done so much for our community um, to make sure that this um, Windrush um, scandal is brought to attention. I think I saw her on the news the other day, and also um, she's had to take a lot of flack, as many black women have, um, for speaking out. She's been called, a, you know, an activist lawyer. I mean, 
thank God for activist lawyers. If only Keir Starmer was um, such an activist lawyer, he's meant to be a human rights activist. But anyway, um, I, I've put two questions in the chat. One of them is kind of a bit facetious because from 2018 to till now, really, every every year there's a round of funding that's been given out to um, to groups that are called Windrush, um, Winter, Windrush at, at um, celebration days and activation days and this sort of thing. And, and when you look at those lists, every year it looks like a cricket mat, a cricket team's getting money or a local, you know, um, coffee shop's getting money. But that doesn't seem to be going to the the lawyers and the community groups that are actually trying to get the money back for people who are claiming this compensation. So it's a bit of a sort of like a double question there. But you know, we we don't seem to be getting the support that we need. And so going on, I'm just following on to what the previous questioner asked. I think Jackie's pointed out repeatedly that the fifty thousand that they're talking about here doesn't take any way into consideration the hundreds of thousands of people in the Caribbean and Africa and Asia even that um, also have been. Um, um, hard done by by the hostile environment policy. People who've gone on holiday and not been allowed back in the country, gone to funerals and not been allowed back in the country, have lost their property, have lost their livelihoods and their and their all their careers, etc. Um, so my second question was, you know, how can we as a as um as a global community express to these um colon colonizers that are still trying to hold the purse strings in our lives, that we too should have generational wealth. We too should be able to leave our children and our loved ones house, you know, the hard work of our brows to be able to um, to go on to the next generation. Um, instead of just leaving them empty handed to start again, over and over again, since, um, since the days of um, the enslavement that we were, left as individuals not as families that well you know you can do a skype i mean I've, that, that's the most important thing you can do a skype send your father back to jamaica or barbados or trinidad i think trinidad is the highest proportion of deportees since the windrush scandal broke um send them to send your father to 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 trinidad and do a skype that's not parenting and that's not the parenting that our families deserve but that's how we've been treated since the days of enslavement, that our fathers and our parents are not allowed to look after their own children. So um, carry on the great work. Um, solidarity to you and Lee Day and to all the other people who are taking on pro bono work. Um, thank you very much for your hard work and the presentation was excellent. Thank you, Doc. Thank you so much. Um, we've got Lucas next and then... Um, Dr. Wilton. You want to unmute, Lucas? No. Can you unmute? Try again. It just went on and off. Need to touch it again. It's just on and off. Can you speak, Lucas? No. no. Okay. We we will leave you to, to figure out um, turning on your speakers. Uh, we'll move on to um, Dr. Wilton. We'll come back to you, Lucas. Dr. Wilton. Yes, <clears throat> thank you for allowing me to, to, to raise a question on the valuation. And so um, we're seeing, um, and I've been following the Windrush uh, generation, the issues there, legal and the opposition that is raised. We see that similar op opposition in the USA when it comes to policing of Blacks. And I'm just letting you know if you, and no one is sort of familiar with my work. I am a barrister lawyer in seven countries. Uh, I am actively following the Black history 
And I would say that uh, the main question is how do we look at reparations and valuing the reparations? We have to look at a wider narrative. And I would say this would be PhD three. Um, the third doctorate that I'm looking at doing is looking at the time period from the 1600s and looking at the rights in which persons of color had in the UK um, during that time, during the Cromwell era and the displacement, because there's a perfect correlation here. I mean, people were in the UK from the Caribbean. They took on rights. They were residents. They're displaced. And now they need to be paid and repaid. They need to be compensated. I, I think that the issue is much wider than this. And people who put up the opposition, I think they know the true narrative tends to be about Blacks and our history and where we are in position. Um, and I've been researching for three years, my name, MacDonald, um, and that means something. So people in the history, today we found out that company 23andMe, a DNA company, they had millions and billions. Their stock is at zero. People are waking up. And if I have something to say, it'll be simply put that I'll answer my own question. Hold off on reparation talk, because when it comes to reparations, we would need to be paid for all that pain and suffering, what has happened, but also the land, the stolen lands. Because exactly. the true narrative would mean that Blacks belonged in Europe. They were there, they were displaced. We don't know the full story, but people are waking up. I've been reading things in Arabic. I've been translating and I've been very vocal on Facebook and other media, but the people are waking up. So 23andMe, if you take it as one company that's fallen, their stock's gone to zero. And I think the rest of them need to follow. They need to go bust because they need proper people in place who are the gatekeepers. Because from the science, which I've been looking at the science, uh, studies that I've been to Africa, I went to the outback and the Aborigines, it does not make any sense. All of the science that's out there about where we come from, the haplogroups and all that, it's just nonsense. I'm a haplogroup E, I'm an African, they say, but I'm really a Euro black, as I call myself. I'm maybe a Caribbean Islander, but we need to hold off because the narrative with the value that is due to us, I think is a lot more expensive and extensive than what we are putting value on ourselves. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Doc, I think the, the, the focus here today really they're looking at compensation and looking at the wind rush. But the wider issue, surely for, for reparations, you know, yeah, you've got some valid questions that, you know, we, we hold off, we look, we keep examining, and there's no, um, you know, there's no fixed um, approach as it were yet. And I, and I think that that needs to continually be looked at. Um, but certainly the, the reparations for slavery claim is well advanced um, by some countries, the carry and so on, and I, I don't see that being stopped. Um, but yes, okay, Thank, thanks, thanks for that. I'll ask one more, we got another question from Desiree Can you hear me? Anderson. How are you, Desiree? Come in. Um, let me... Who is it? Yes. Can you no, hear me? Did, did, no, okay. We got Desri, and then we I'm got back. Roy is trying to speak. I'm not sure. Lucas, Lucas, are you are you able to now? Yes, yes, yes. Can you hear me now? Okay, Desri, if you just hold on a minute, Lucas so, is up here. Come in, yes. Okay. Come in. My name is my name is my name is actually Egg. My name is Egbert. But good afternoon to everyone. Yeah. Um, Egbert, I want yeah. Egbert. Yeah, I wanted to say to Jerome. I'm trying Jerome, to uh, that was well. People. Yeah, that was sorry. well well done in going back over the history mm -hmm. and pinpointing a kind of start point, uh, which goes back to about eighty years or so, as you pointed out. The question I wanted to ask you is: Would you have a suggestion as to how we go forward, or your generation goes forward in monitoring legislation and policies and plans across successive governments? to ensure something like this doesn't happen again as far as Windrush goes. Because if this has been uh, taken on by successive governments over 80 years and we were blind to it living in the UK, with all the activism we've done through the 70s, 60s, 80s, 90s, I mean, what else is coming down the line? Especially with the prisons, as the man mentioned, being built in Jamaica by Cameron, etc., etc. So any suggestions, any thoughts, Jerome, as to how we can 
put some mechanism or, or means to monitor what our parliamentarians are doing, the people that we vote for when they need us to vote for them. And after we've done that, they drop us and dump us in a pile of the proverbial. That's my question to Jerome. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Now we'll take the one other question and then uh, Jerome, you'll come in. Uh, there's Ree, but before you come in, there's Ree, let me just take time to welcome two of my executive members I'm seeing have appeared who I'd made apologies for you not being here because you were away doing something else. So I'm really glad you were able to come, Nadine, and also Frank, I saw you there, there's Frank. So, so thank you for joining us. Okay, Desri, if you put your question now and then um, we'll ask um, Jerome to start to answer some of those. Okay, good afternoon. Could you hear me? Hello? Yeah, loud and clear. Okay, this is a, a question. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is a question for Jerome. Um, my mom, she came here in 1958, and I put in the application form for her as a deceased estate, and they turned me down. And I didn't see see how my mum didn't fall under that category. So I need. Thank I need you. help Thank in the okay, appealing Jerome. their decision. Yes, we got a question. I'm Thank sure you. you got it there, Jerry. So yes, please, yeah. please take the floor. Um, yes, coming back to those, I come back to you, Desiree, first, um, because that, that seems really important to address straight away. Maybe it'd be best if, you know, if we get your contact details and to follow that up. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, because 58, yeah, and just to get a bit more details to discuss that, but that's fine. I'll, um, I'll put my email in the chat afterwards and then we can, can get in contact. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And come, I mean... I, I thought um, the first question question from the gentleman about the the class action lawsuits. I mean, it's it's a really important question in how we think about class actions. Um, I mean, in terms of, I guess what you say is like judicial reviews, public challenges to the compensation scheme. Um, have been a lot, and I think of the scheme as almost an edifice which has been chipped away by small class action, um, small class actions. For example, um, the good character requirement when you like to um, naturalize as a British citizen, there's a good character requirement that is applied. You look at your criminal history, look at the convictions that have to be spent before a certain amount of time when you when you make your application the application could be refused but on that requirement um for example there was a judicial review against that and how it's applied to the windrush cohort um i know it was refused previously i know it went it went back into court in december 2023 um so if anyone else knows exactly where it is now but that's an example on good character um there's another review there's a the, the the Home Office will be in court in April. The Black Equity Organization um, did a really interesting, really important challenge. And this was on Windrush Lessons Learn Review recommendations, right? That came out in 2020, which Wendy Williams did. Um, there were 13, 13 of these recommendations. Um, the Home Office dropped three of them in January, the start of this year, January 2023 really important ones which what another person was talking about as well is about oversight and about the oversight that we get um, as a community into the home office the checks and balances that are required the home office dropped those and so the black equity organization have brought a judicial review and they'll be in court i think it's april or may of this year so that's an example of certain class actions as i think you know we need to start thinking about a much wider one you know people are talking about making the, the scheme um, independent about getting legal aid um how do we bring it up to speed with the post office scandal for example and how that treatment is so th there's quite a few and i think it's really important to actually map out those kind of smaller reviews but maybe not a mammoth class action yet on people traveling to jamaica and coming back if that would affect their employment insurance absolutely um employment if you you know if you'd lost 
if you went to Jamaica, I mean, it depends because if that person went because um, they were denied employment because of the immigration status, then you could look at a claim. Um, and similarly, you could look at benefits, child benefits they lost and housing. Um, insurance have to get a bit more information. But I guess on that point, I'll just say quickly, is what we're seeing, and that's linked to that, is someone might have been out of work for eight years. And we've seen this, someone who's uh, 50 years old um, is told they can't work. They lose employment for eight years, right? And then at 58, 2019, they get their status back. At 58, they then, so they'll get their compensation, but they're then expected at that age to re-enter the workforce, um, upskill, get a job, but the compensation is not reflecting that, the, the loss of earning potential. Because during that time, that person would have trained. They would have, um, they might have done a career switch. But then the Home Office are expecting someone at that age to come back into the workforce um, and be, and, you know, even if they haven't done necessary upskilling. So that's in relation, that's an area we need to change as well. Um, Dr. Liz, thank you. Um, I completely agree. I think that community funding community funding is crucial and groups doing i think artistic um you know artistic celebration and those kind of events are, are really important and, and this funding i think now for community groups is, is really crucial on, on casework um i think funding always you know can come with a double-edged sword right you see it in history where um funding will come in after you know kind of into riots and that kind of thing and the issue you have to really look at the terms of the funding does it allow you to to be political um is it a bit of you know the carrot and the stick that's the carrot approach because a lot of strings with that with that funding can actually depoliticize a lot of groups and i think you know you, you can see that um in history in the 60s post 80s um to, to develop funding to neutralize groups. And so I think that's really important that the groups develop these kind of forums to discuss strategy so that we don't, you know, don't become dependent on state funding um, for those kind of activities. So that, that's my note on, on funding really is we have to really be careful about the terms and conditions and not let it numb or, or depoliticize the, the demands that are being made. Um, I mean, in terms of, yeah, going over that that huge question from Egbert about how you know what is to be done from this generation's perspective so this doesn't happen again um the i think this is a really urgent task six years into the scandal um to take stock because we've had to a lot of all these community groups have had to almost you know, it, it's been running around just to do this initial healing, right? To, to get compensation, to get people together. And I think this is an important time now, five, six years on, to take stock and to ask those kind of questions that you've put, to ask the deeper questions of Windrush and say, what does this mean um, for the next generation so it doesn't, so it doesn't happen? I, I mean, immediately, oversight is important, impact assessments, so that lessons learned review, which is being dropped, one of them is about home office scrutiny. That's something that we need to, to make sure um, takes place going forward. But I think th those are the questions that we really need to ask ourselves and get together. Um, I don't I don't have the answers, but I think the answers will come in these kind of forums, um, having them more and more often um, to ask the big questions about Windrush. But I think that it has really politicized a lot of a lot of people, some people don't know about it, but it has really politicized, especially young people. Um, and you see it in popular culture, the way that it's, it's when Rush is mentioned. So, and it can act as a kind of bouncing, as a window to look at, you know, other other futures and landscapes to, to address. Um, on the issue of reparations, I mean, I, I agree. Um, it's Dr. Wilton, Lucas, Dr. Wilson. Um, I agree. I mean, it's absolutely huge question and I think I agree that people are really waking up now and it seems like a an important time you know to, to build on the the shoulders of reparations movement which is going on for, for absolutely you know for, for decades um 
um, and the various conferences and so on. I would agree. I mean, for me, it's about, especially linked to Windrush, it's about system change rather than smaller philanthropic gifts. And I think that's something we need to be wary of because you're seeing it more and more is, um, you know, I, I don't think, I mean, yeah, the Guardian, you know, the, the hiring certain people as an apology for what happened or for racism or, or large companies will make uh, donations, reparations, donations, but that, that, that's a bit of an easy out, isn't it? It's not, it's not asking wider questions of, of, of employment, of international finance, of economics, um, of world trade, you know, that that's the kind of system change that, you know, we need for reparatory justice, but uh, 20,000 or 50,000 here and there for, for publicity stunt it, it isn't enough at all. Um, so I think we have to be wary about and, and see how Windrush links into that, from that point about wider compensation. Um, yeah, I think I've gone. I think I've gone, gone through those. Thank and thank you so much. And I think you've answered those very, really well. And um, I don't know if anybody wanted to come back with you, and especially that you're offering practical support um, to somebody who needs it there. I think that's really important. Uh, on, on the wider question of um, the Windrush, and I think, yes, it's we, we've been very much more in the popular culture as such, but um, in some ways, I think part of a government move to try and whitewash the whole thing, that we remember it as a, something we're celebrating rather than this awful scandal and um and uh, atrocities really that was committed. And I think as somebody rightly said, you know, these things would not have happened without slavery um, as, uh, you know, because the way in which, you know, people have been treated really is, could only have come from a place where they don't see us as humans and having feelings and family and connectedness, um, which is what we know happened during the period of enslavement. So, yeah. Thank, thanks for all of those comments. Now I see, like, um, is there any other new questions? I uh, see um, Mr. Lucas wants to come back to us, Egbert. No, just very um, quickly. Come back, it's, Egbert. No, it's just, it's not, a, it's not a question. I wanted to say well done again to Jerome. And also a question to him. Are, are you contactable? Who, if who is? Jerome, is he Who would you like to contact? Jerome. Jerome. Yes, I think he said yes. He was going to put details in the chat. Um, yes, I'll do that. I'll put my email. Brilliant. Yeah. Cheers. Okay, we've got Stephen wanted to come back. Yes, uh, thanks again, uh, Mr. Chair. Jerome, I really appreciate everything that you're doing. Uh, it, it's fantastic, especially for a young person like you to be involved with this at the level that you are. You, 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 you <laughs> bro, I can't tell you much I appreciate you. But two things that I raised that I think uh, you didn't touch on. Folks traveled for funerals or in, in emergency cases and had to return. They may have gone on vacation thinking that their legal status was not in jeopardy. Upon returning to Britain, they were told you can't enter. Since they may have had dependents who, especially, they may have been home care attendants, they may have arranged for people to look here after their loved ones in their absence, now they can't return. What impact did that have on those families or loved ones? And how does that play into the fantastic work that you've been doing for compensation for the financial difficulties that they had to endeavor? Thank you. Okay, Jeremy, you yeah. want to come in? Yeah, but thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. On those types of cases, um, because, yeah, I'm thinking of a of, of, of a family, actually, where there's quite similar facts. Um, for the family members, right, and this would be capped at your, your, your close family member, let's say someone has been denied entry, um, and let's say they couldn't come back to the UK, and let's say they even let's say it got resolved a month later, or let's say it got resolved two years later and it could come back. So 
we would need to look very closely at those two weeks or, or two year period. We'd speak to the close family member. Um, and yes, you'd put forward, you could put forward a claim on that basis. For the family member, so this is capped at um, a, a direct descendant or spouse or unmarried partner, the, the heads of loss for that person, let's say the, the son or the daughter of the person who couldn't get back into the country, right? You would look at the immigration fees and travel that they've paid to, to get their, their family member back in. Um, you would look, and then there's a discretionary payment, which is hardly ever used, and it's a bit redundant, really. But then we'd look at impact on life. Crucially, look at the impact on life for that person, for the secondary claimant. Impact on life has five different levels and scales of how much payment you could get to you really need to start evidencing how were they affected? How was their ability to live a normal life affected during that time? Um, did you need mental health support? How did your physical health um, deteriorate? Did you lose job prospects? Did you become unemployed? Um, how was your housing affected? So you would look at all of those and you're trying to make an argument about how that period impacted you. And that that's the kind of work that, that we do and, and we've seen it you know where even for a couple of months um someone was stuck out of the country and they the secondary claimant lost their job developed anxiety and depressive disorder and so all of that comes into into impact on life payment does that answer your question Stephen? yeah okay. uh that is the thing yeah. I was like, it, but yes, you, you, you're doing a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you. Was that a hand you raised in, Paul? Or, okay. Um, we've got a hand raised. Orta? Kilkenny? Can you come yes. in? Thank you. And thank you so much for this program. I have a question for Jerome. I don't know if this touches on the issue that Stephen is raising, but what about persons who return to the Caribbean for whatever reason, and then were not able to re-enter Britain and have since passed away, are they or their descendants also included in the compensation program? Or perhaps they haven't passed away, but they don't realize that there's been this um, change. Is there any outreach to people who are um, who return to the Caribbean or to Africa or wherever, um, are they covered in this program? Thank you. Sorry about this. This is, sorry, I just, I missed the first part of your question. Someone who's gone outside of the UK and couldn't return? Correct. Right? Because uh, you seem to be speaking about people who, you know, they may have gone to their birthplace for a funeral or whatever, but then they tried to return and now they're, you know, they're either back in Britain or they're aware of the program, the compensation programs. But what about those persons? Because we're speaking in large part about elderly persons, some of whom may now be deceased. What about those persons who went to the Caribbean for funeral or whatever reason, um, found their way back to Britain, was blocked and are not aware of the compensation program are they covered or did would they have to have returned to britain oh um i hope i'm being no. clear Jerome, no, I, Jerome? I get that but i might defer yeah. to jackie on that yeah yeah um Definitely. if i've understood the question correctly then um so long as they can show that the reason they weren't able to come back to the uk was something to do with the home office so or, or a consular office. So they applied for a visa in the case of Jamaica, um, because obviously, you know, from around 2000, Jamaicans couldn't just pitch up and enter as a, even as a visitor without a visa, or Ghanaians and Nigerians, for example. So if they applied, if they had a right of abode, um, applied for a visa and was refused, we have been able to show um, that that was a wrongful refusal and people in that situation have gone on to get um, compensation. And there have been quite a lot of high profile cases of people stuck 
in various countries. Um, the Home Office has had to bring them back in some instances, and other people have made their own way back. People from the non-visa countries just sort of came back as a visitor, weren't sort of given any hassle at a port, and managed to stay. Um, so that's one of the reasons why it's disproportionately affecting Jamaicans, because they were a visa national, although there are some other reasons why more Jamaicans are affected, historical reasons. Um, one of the problems with the Windrush compensation schemes, a lot of people just think um, because they had a right of abode or because they'd lived in the UK for a particular period um, or because they were settled here and went out and got excluded by virtue of the changes that we call the two year rule, um, that they can claim compensation, but you can't, you have to show either that you made some active attempt to come back and was blocked, or um, if you didn't do that, um, you need to also show, or even if you did that, that you then suffered some loss. So you lost out on your pension or you lost out on healthcare is a big one. Um, you see, you probably saw the case of Vernon Van Riel, um, who lost all his teeth because he couldn't afford private dental care in Jamaica. Um, but had he been in the UK, he would have got NHS treatment. So it's fact by fact, case by case. We can't really answer these questions without knowing more. Well, if I could okay, just jump you. in here, j j just for clarification. Jerome, I think what Roberta was asking was a two-part question. First off, if the person visited or when they were in, when they were out of Britain, they died. What compensation could their family get because they were not allowed back into the community, uh, back into Britain before they passed away? There are the estate second, claims, the, just Stephen, there are estate claims. So the death of somebody, although, I mean, it's obvious that that per, horrible that that person themselves never saw justice, but the claim does not die when someone dies. Um, we are doing quite a lot of work with estates. Um, we also get involved with the probate or the administration, I'm afraid, because most people don't have wills. Um, but the claim does not, not die. So if you know somebody who was in this position and got stuck abroad um, and died, um, their, their heirs can still make a claim. There is a category called estate claims. Okay, thanks. And, and uh, what I think Roberta was trying to ask, uh, now let's, based on what you just said, are the, the survivors of the now deceased aware of what you just said and what kind of outreach is being done to the survivors to make sure that they could be compensated based on what you just said. I mean, that's an entirely different thing. We are highly critical of the lack of outreach. Um, I'm a cricket fan and Martin Ford Casey, who designs the compensation, fan, uh, compensation scheme as a cricket fan, and we're always talking about cricket. And he was listening on a dab radio station um, when the when there was a sort of inter-island cricket match going on in Jamaica. So this is inter-Caribbean island cricket match. And during the break, there were adverts from the British government advertising the European Union settled status scheme. That was for the three, or now we know it was five million EU citizens that had a deadline to apply for either pre or settled status pre-Brexit. And that was advertised so widely <laughs> that it was picked up on a DAB radio station that was only broadcast. Well, I suppose DAB, it was broadcasting everywhere, but it was focused. Its target audience was the Caribbean. And we keep complaining to the Home Office that the outreach has not been good enough. Particularly, I've done lots of appearances on Caribbean radio and TV. I've done a lot in Jamaica, a lot of work in Jamaica. There are some brilliant Jamaican activists and lawyers doing a lot of work in Jamaica. The real problem area for me is West Africa, where there are lots of victims and two things are happening with West Africa. A lot of people, because there's a slightly different pattern of migration, a lot of them came as students, but ended up with the right of abode, couldn't get jobs um, because of racism, were highly qualified, went back thinking that they had indefinite leave to remain. Um, since the scandal, they've tried over the years to come back, not been allowed to come back. Since the scandal, they've tried and there's a disproportionate level of refusals amongst them. And I think that's because their numbers are going to be huge 
and the Home Office is worried about opening the floodgates. So um, I want to look at a, a, some sort of campaign around that and some sort of peripatetic work around that group. I think it's fair to say a lot of people in the Caribbean do know about the Windrush scandal, but the outreach, the engagement has been poor. So I would not be surprised um, if there are people who don't know or who don't know that it applies to them. And in fact, there are people in the UK like that. I am amazed just about a month ago, a chap came to me who was a victim of the Windrush scandal and didn't even know about it or what could be done. So yeah, the government, it's black people. They don't really care. They've spent very little. Somebody mentioned the funding is, you know, 150,000 pounds. EU citizens had 50 million pounds that was divided up between 90 community groups. Um, to do outreach work with EU citizens. There was a £500,000 fund available for uh, groups to do work on Windrush, but not advocacy work. So that's why you saw the cricket matches and the street parties and the buntings and all the rubbish, because they deliberately wrote it so that it was restrictive and you couldn't do any real work that was going to make any real difference. But then what was worse than that, the 500,000 went down to 150,000. So in, in effect, it's, it, it doesn't exist, really. And, and I appreciate everything that you've said. And you've, you've added so much more to this conversation and you've really enlightened me to other stuff. But just to make one more point that Roberta was talking about, what about people who try to come back, were told that they couldn't and they just gave up? And they don't realize that they are still entitled or they were still entitled to well, if, compensation if you, or if to return. You know of, if you know of such a person, then just send them our way. Um, we are a big law firm. And so we I worked pro bono at the start of this and saw a couple of hundred people and represented them. Um, but we the law firm I work for now does not work pro bono. Um, so um, but so I want to point out that if they come to us, um, then they there are fees, um, not upfront fees, but there are fees. But so I also want to say, and on this call are some excellent people. There's Glenda Andrew from Preston Windrush. There's also Glenda Caesar, who has become a champion advocate. I think I saw Clive Foster a while ago from Nottingham Windrush, um, Lorna Markland from Luton Windrush. There are, I've seen Herman who does work in London, Herman English. Um, so there are some really, and, and they're working at a grassroots level and doing some excellent work. So if somebody, because because I don't want to say, just send somebody to me when I know that, you know, we are a profit making institute, um, but there are some real good organizations up and down the country who are doing this work. Mr. And Chairman, you, and you, thank and you, thank you so Sorry, I just want to add, you, oh, should, seek, you. you should seek professional help from them or from us or from other lawyers who are doing it. You shouldn't just try to work this out. It is extremely complex. And Dr. Godfrey Martin posted something in the chat about the two-stage process being eligible under the scheme, the Windrush scheme, before you become eligible under the Windrush compensation scheme, which is a very different thing. Mr. Chair, based on what was just okay. said, may I please make a suggestion? that the contacts that were just mentioned, can you send that out to folks who attend these, these uh, forum uh, so that yes, they sir. could actually forward that information to people who they know may be in need of this information? Okay, once you're on the email list, I'm sure that Steve um, is going to be able to do that. Um, and I think this this meeting, some of it at least, was recorded, so people can revisit it and 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 get the information that I see in the chat. There's a lot of information in the chat. Um, thank you so much um, for all your interventions and your questions. And, and um, sorry, uh, um, look, can I just can I just say in relation to that because I don't think everybody. Um, there was an organisation called the Windrush National Organisation. If you just Google that. Um, it's oh, it's Clive Morris Foster has just put it in the chat. I was going to say nearly all the groups okay. that I mentioned are part of that Windrush National Organization. So you'll be able to find somebody who's working in the area that you live in or can help you if you're overseas. All right. Yeah. 
Thank you for that, Jackie. And I think certainly the, 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 um, the issue of seeking legal um, expertise is really important because I, I noticed just recently with the equal pay for women in case that in in, in, um, in Glasgow, where some women, you know, the, the government and also the some of the trade unions actually encouraged people to take what was being offered and ended up with very little as compared to people who sought legal um, exp experts um, advice on the issue. And they actually received, you know, sometimes up to 10, 20 times more than what they, they, they was being offered by the government. Um, the people who signed away their rights by taking this small amount. So I think certainly uh, I would encourage people to seek legal advice on this before they start signing any papers for anything. Okay, I think we, we're coming to the end of the meeting. We've got um, Desri, this be the last question if you want to come back, come in quickly. Well, afternoon, yeah. Desri, yeah. Hi. Be listening. Thank you. Oh, you just you've just um, put yourself on. Oh yeah, I'd just like to say um, thank you very, um, to each and every one of you for all the information. It's been very informative, and to you, Jerome, well done. And I've got your email, so I should reach out to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I should say a big general thank you to all the speakers, all the contributors, all the questions. It certainly made this meeting very rich. And I think that um, we will consult with Jackie and others to see how we can put on a public meeting, which hopefully might get the information and attention to people who haven't, um, don't know about this. You mentioned the West Africans and so on. So we will try and broaden the, the, that, uh, the agenda as it were to include um, and. Somebody needs to be, be silenced there. So, yes. So, um, I'm sure you'll join me and thank, say a big thank you to Jerome for leading this discussion. Thank you so much. And um, and we appreciate that very much. And for, for all the supporting acts that came in, um, thank you. Thank you all so much. Now, our March meeting might be a face-to-face -face meeting in Islington. We will try to make it hybrid. I know there's some reservations about that working. But um, we will try to see if we can make a hybrid meeting for March. But uh, we, we've actually decided that we will have a face-to-face -face meeting in Islington for the March meeting. So if we don't see you in March, we will see you in April. We hope you will keep joining our meeting. It was great to see so many new faces um, come to this meeting. And we encourage you to look at our website, see what we get up to, see if you want to join us. You can contact us through the web website and i'll give jackie the final word as she's got her hand up oh yeah just very briefly because christopher oliver in the chat mentioned the race equality act legislation um that's being launched by Kia tomorrow at two o'clock um and i've been part of the working group on that working on the white paper um there is something in it on windrush it's very disappointing on immigration very very disappointing there are some things, it, there is a press release, um, which is embargoed until eight o'clock this evening. So I can send it out to people after that. Um, there are some interesting things in it on equal pay, um, ironing out disparities around healthcare, issues around the criminal justice system, implementing the LAMI reviews um, and so on. Some stuff around economy and procurement to increase equity, some stuff around the curriculum, whether that, piece of legislation all we've been doing is writing the white paper um it will be called the race uh equality act um i'm surprised it's still on the table given how i think labor is kind of shying away from any issues that might rile up the racist space i'm surprised it's got this far we won't know the full detail of it till tomorrow but the reason why i think it's important for us to consider it is that I think we really do need to be lobbying to make sure that it gets tougher. One of the key things that I think it's going to lack is enforcement. There's no point having uh, equality legislation and asking people to report data if there's no enforcement, if you don't um, do what you're supposed to do. So I hope everybody will get involved with the act. 
all, I suppose it's not an act, get involved with the white paper and the bill, if it ever becomes one, and really lobby hard um, with your politicians, your MPs, to get it to work, because it's the one opportunity. I think my view is that if Labour does get in, it looks as though they will, that there'll probably be a one-term government, I think. I don't know why I think that, but I do think that. So we better make sure that we get this right. My final say, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I think we'll definitely put it on the web on our website when we get receive it from you, Jackie. So people can visit our website yeah. to see it on the website. Um, Mr. Chairman, may remember, I just interject just, one, just, one second? You just have to hold on. You just uh, have do, to do, Google doing, Caribbean doing a hybrid, labor solidarity. Doing a hybrid is very easy. I've done stuff using my yes. cell phone. Hybrid. Okay. It's a very easy yeah. process to do, Mr. Chair. And these these meetings are too yeah. important to miss out on. So if you need any help, please reach out to me and I'll tell you how simple it is to do a hybrid uh, Zoom. It's very easy. Thank you. Thank, 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 thanks very much. Thanks very much can, for, for uh, plugging for the, the hybrid. Can you put your website thanks. in the chat? We must, close, we must close the meeting now. Um, Please, you can contact us by email as well. Um, you've got our website. Um, put questions to us, and we appreciate it very much that you attended this meeting. But um, we must close now. Um, thank you all again for attending. Thank, thank you to the speakers. Thank you for a very um, engaging meeting. Thank you all. Thank Bye you. now. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.